that's it we're live on facebook and youtube and i don't think anywhere else but maybe somewhere else uh we're live here now me harry ekman ceo of the world cetacean alliance and i'm here with tom mustel author of the amazing book how to speak whale um so a brief introduction to those of you that don't know either of us uh as i said uh, I, uh the world cetacean alliance uh, we are the largest global network of partners working on ocean protection and uh, conservation, uh, specifically the protection of cetaceans, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. And uh, we have a number of campaigns and projects that I would uh, urge anybody watching to uh, check out on our website and uh, look at the work that we do. But joined here today by, as I said, Tom Mustel, um, who is... Um, a documentary filmmaker, uh, director, author of an amazing book uh, that we are going to be talking about today. But uh, Tom is the winner. Uh, his films have uh, won more than 30 international awards. Uh, one that I'm particularly aware of is um, the, the uh, BAFTA award winning series uh, Inside Nature's Giants, uh, which is a brilliant, brilliant program if, uh, if you haven't watched it already. Uh, he's worked with some of the greatest conservations of, conservationists of our time in the work that he's done, including David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg. And now uh, he's here to talk to us about his, uh, his book, his best-selling book, How to Speak Whale, uh, which has just been uh, by, the New, uh, by the New Yorker magazine, uh, one of the best reads of 2022 and having read it myself, actually, I haven't read it, Tom. I listened to it on your advice. I listened to the audio book, um, and it was absolutely fantastic. It was a brilliant read slash listen. Uh, so welcome, Tom. Oh, thanks very much for having me, Harry. Um, and I'd just like to apologize to everybody for my boring background, but I've had the flu, so I'm at home. So I've been trying to liven things that hit up as much as possible. So this is my daughter's orca that's uh, <laughs> enlivening this otherwise pretty boring uh, view of me that you've got here. Well, that's okay. It's a real pleasure to, to talk to you, Tom. Um, we chatted uh, a little while ago um, about the book and the work that you've done and, and the parallels between, um, you know, the work that we do at the WCA and uh, and the link to to your uh, your work your uh, and, and your book and the outcomes of the book we'll, we'll get onto in a little bit um, but I actually wanted to kind of start out before that as um, I, I, I'm always curious with anybody that I talk to you're you're clearly super passionate about the natural world and the animal kingdom and um and, and where does that come from like where where did you where did this love of nature and this fascination with it come from yeah it's a really good question because i i'm not really sure i grew up in london so in a way i wasn't really surrounded by very much nature um we were fortunate to have a garden and i spent a lot of my childhood in the garden and going to our local park um and, and my granddad lived in the Yorkshire Dales so we spent a lot of time up there with him and spending time outside there um I think I mean there's I think there's two kind of human elements to it like one was that the only tv shows that my parents let me watch as a young person the Star Trek and David Attenborough documentary <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's, that's a very feel like, strict household you got going there. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean it loosened up a bit later, and also my older sister used to sneak us into her room, and she, me and my brother, and we'd watch, you know, other naughty things you weren't supposed to watch, um, like Grease, the movie. Um, but um, <laughs> we, I feel like, uh, so I, I saw a lot of the natural world through the television, and uh, and I and I and I think the other thing is I, I think I was quite um introverted as a child and i loved reading and loved reading about other places and uh, other species and adventures um and 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 because i was a bit introverted and didn't and at first didn't quite know how to get on with other people i think that also drew me to animals and we had a pet cat that i was very good friends with and we'd go out adventuring in the garden together uh, and i always just felt very very happy and at home um in 
nat more natural places. Um, uh, but I love people. I'm not like just an animals only person. But I, I mean, that's a very, I, don't, I still don't really know. I've asked this to myself quite a lot, Harry. And I, I, I think it's just something that gradually built up um, from, from just having the good fortune to be in some beautiful places um, and to have been given the time and the opportunity to be curious about them and go and explore in them. That's really interesting. It's, you know, sometimes um, when I speak to people in animal welfare and you'll, I'll, I'll ask this question of them and, and there's often like, uh, you know, they grew up in like an amazing environment and, you know, were, were, were lucky enough to be uh, around such incredible things. And I grew up in London as well. Um, so, you know, I, I have a similar uh, story to you in that just kind of, I don't know where it came from, it probably did come a little bit from David Attenborough and those documentaries and watching Life on Earth for the first time and how uh, incredible that was. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things, you couldn't pinpoint it to any one time, it was just, I guess, a, a collection mm. of experiences that, that for whatever reason um, kind of bring you to, to this love of nature and environment and conservation. I think, and I think, I, I think it's it's a very normal thing to find the natural world interesting. I think it's a peculiar time that we even ask each other, "Oh, how did you get mm. into that?" It's like, how did you learn to enjoy colours and art and <laughs> and surprises? You know, like they're, they're things that kind of I think everybody should get the chance to feel like that's they're part of their world. Um, I mean, also London is a pretty great place for some wildlife. Like I saw a kingfisher a month ago in the River Lee, oh, uh, wow. really close, and a bittern. A week ago, I saw a bittern, like a stone's throw away. And today I saw a dog fox sunning itself on the snow, like huh. maybe like five yards from me, just through a fence. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not an impoverished place to, 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 to see the natural world, but it's not wild, I guess, in the yeah. way we think of it. Um, no, it's, it, it's true. It's there if you look for it. It's just uh, having the, you know, having the eyes to actually see what's in front of you. I, I, I was interested there when you mentioned Star Trek. Uh, for me, it's weird, but seeing as you mentioned it, like for me, when I think about whales, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, it had a strangely profound effect on me. You know, the humpback whales. And um, mm -hmm. and, and I know you mentioned it in the book, but it was something that I, I thought of a lot as I was listening to the book and how, you know, uh, language was so important and uh yeah i'd urge, urge people to watch that film if they're interested in the importance of the potential importance of whales and being able to speak to them it's a great point and diane in the comments just mentioned that too yeah it's a wonderful <laughs> star trek film um and i feel like there is a lot of overlap between the kind of uh like you know the prime directive in star trek of, of going to explore and seek things out but not to mess them up not to interfere or try and conquer them and that kind of, as somebody who feels like we've got that wrong with our interaction with other, like, living beings on this planet, I feel like that's a deep impression on me. It's very humane. Um, and uh, when you were doing the, um, uh, you know, your, your, your career in, in filmmaking, yeah, Diane is actually my sister, so it's no wonder. That <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Oh, family, so family, family watching this, which is great. <laughs> um, but your your um, your career in, in in documentary making and filmmaking, um, you know, we'll get on to the event that that prompted the book in a second. Um, but obviously, you've had a pretty illustrious career before that. And so, what um, uh, what took you down that route? Was it was it filmmaking in general? Was it uh, was it uh, kind of documentary filmmaking? Uh, kind of what took you down that route? I, I never thought I'd be a filmmaker. I started out as a conservation biologist. So I studied mm. zoology at university and I went off to work in field conservation. And I did experience in that uh, in coral reefs and with the RSPB and with um, short fin pilot whales. And uh, I thought that would be my life. But I, when I was working in conservation, I didn't really think I was being very effective. But I really liked talking about it to other people. And I felt there weren't really very many good places where you could see stories about, hopeful stories about conservation. So I left and worked as a runner in a TV company um, and uh, uh, gradually learned how to make films in the, the sort of apprenticeship that you get there. And was fortunate to be given opportunities by lots of 
of filmmakers I really admired and to see them work um, and eventually to get to sort of direct the films myself and make my own company and make films for that company. But um, I think, I mean, in some ways it was very unplanned because the thing I thought I was going to do, I didn't do. But in other ways, even when I was at uni, I remember we went on a biology field trip. Uh, this was at Cambridge University and everybody was very serious and they were very good at biology and went to go and study the seashore. But I became very fascinated with building a really beautiful aquarium that uh, out of all of the um, uh, anemones and the marine invertebrates and crustaceans there, uh, just to, to watch them and to show them to each other. Um, and yeah, so I was always very excited coming back from lectures to telling friends of mine on different courses about the things I'd learned in natural sciences, trying to explain to the medics and the lawyers um, about sort of, you know, uh, how <laughs> chimpanzee cultures worked. So in some ways that, that thread was always there, um, but in other ways it was sort of accidental. Because um, when I started out, I, th I just, I, I was basically feeling quite lost. I didn't know how to make films or, or how to go about it at all. I guess it's such a, a, in retrospect, it's such a natural connection there, isn't it? You know, it's like if there's something through conservation and wildlife that you're passionate about, being able to capture it somehow, being able to share it with other people to kind of like uh, get that enthusiasm and give other people an opportunity to see the world through the way that, you know, in the way that you're seeing mm. it. There's, there's quite a nice, you know, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to, to go down that route. Yes, and I feel like, I mean, I think enthusiasm is something that I've got in buckets and I've always had to sort of temper it down because uh, it can be a bit too much. But in storytelling, it's very, very helpful because it, it's a long process and you have to remember why you're doing it. And um, so I've really found it like, yeah, to be able to feed off that. Um, and I also just genuinely find it fascinating, the work. It's such a privilege to get to like learn about all these different people's lives and the discoveries they're making and to try and contribute in that way. But it's a really nice job too. Like it's really interesting. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, those of us that work in animal welfare, you're always kind of talking about, you know, you always hear this, this, this thing that, uh, you know, I, I prefer animals to people, but really, like, you can't do this kind of work without being interested in people and wanting to speak to people and, and, and be involved in that kind of work. And yeah, that storytelling aspect is, is, uh, is vital. And being able it's to relational. Yeah. yeah, I think it's relational. And I think I find it hard sometimes when people say, like, I'm an animal person, because like we're, humans are animals. I find it just I feel there must be something either they've been hurt by people or they've been or, or they've they haven't had a chance to connect to other people in the same way that when people say I'm not really into nature stuff, it's not my thing. I feel like that I'm not sure there are people who aren't into relating to other animals, but I think it's more about opportunities to widen your circle of compassion and interest um, and that's what I think I try and do with my work is really to find opportunities to make the lives of other species uh, feel relevant to people who might not have understood how they fitted into them. Well talking of storytelling the catalyst for this book is a pretty incredible story that I'm sure you've told thousands of times already uh, but for those that, that don't know it and, uh, and, and haven't read the book yet, um, what was it that happened in Monterey Bay that, um, that set this all in motion? Well, yeah, it's, um, it's a pretty wild story. Uh, I, and actually, like, as you were joking just before we started this, like I had another prop that I was going to put. <laughs> this is my, my daughter's humpback. I'll, I was going to put it here, but I thought that seemed a bit dis disrespectful maybe to the orca. But um, yeah, so I was kayaking in Monterey Bay in California in 2015 uh, when a humpback whale breached. And it did a full breach and it came out of the sea and it landed um, on top of our kayak and dragged us underwater. Um, and it smashed up the kayak and we were pulled quite far under. We had to swim back up. But we were both I was in a kite with my friend Charlotte, there were two of us, but both unharmed, uh, which is miraculous. And afterwards, another, another sort of total fluke because we were far away in this kayak from where the main humpback group were. So all the other people who were looking at whales that day 
were looking out to sea, whereas somebody was filming back towards the shore and saw this whale leap out and land on top of us. And they put the video online and it went viral and became sort of on every news show for a couple of 40 hour news cycles. Uh, and uh, yeah, my life's never really been the same since. Was that was that weird? I mean, to, to suddenly be a, a kind of viral video sensation like that? Yes, it was. I think if I'm honest, it was horrible because you, the people who make the news don't view you mm. necessarily as somebody to be gentle or careful of. They view you as a story to feed mm. into the news. And you, you we'd almost died. And and I think because it was so beautiful and spectacular, this video, I think we were it, we had to be quite careful with with um, ourselves having to. And it was only a couple of days afterwards, like having to kind of revisit this, especially for my friend, Charlotte, very traumatic experience because uh, she's an accountant and she'd never seen a whale before until that day. Um, and uh, so, and, and as a filmmaker, I'm very used to filming and being behind the camera. And so also it was quite jarring for me to feel so out of control, you know, like to be in this story and see it taken and just thrown around all over the place and have, lots of people feeding in with their, their opinions about what happened. Uh, you know, like people saying like that it was our fault or that we should have died. And, um, you know, we, we were keeping our distances like along with the regulations from the whales and the whale watching tour. And I used to volunteer on a whale watching boat, making sure vessels kept their distance. So I found that particularly hurtful that it was seen as something that I was doing that was sort of bad for the whales. Um, and that people thought it'd be funny if we died. That was kind of like, <laughs> You know, it's 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 just a, and it, but like ultimately, this is this is minor complaints. Really, what it opened my eyes to was how awful it must be to be in the news cycle for something bad, where somebody had got hurt, or when you'd done something really wrong. Um, it just made me sort of really aware and feel for people who've had that experience, because ultimately we were fine, and it was a pretty cool thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it must have been not at all what i mean you were there and privileged to see such you know despite being almost drowned and killed by it like the rest of the time you were there on um, by by all accounts <coughs> it's one of the most amazing uh uh um group of whales like that hadn't been there in in, in numbers that significant for in living memory so you were there experiencing this this incredible <coughs> thing and then it turns into, yeah, as you said, a news cycle and a, and a, and, and, but ultimately led you to here now and mm -hmm. being able to talk about this book. And, and I remember in, um, in the book, you talk about how if, if this video hadn't have been filmed, it was somebody watching it. It was an expert that was watching it, uh, who actually noticed something peculiar about the behavior of the whale, wasn't it? Yes. I, well, I remember afterwards thinking how strange it is that this, incident has happened at a time where everybody carries a cell phone with the video camera on it in their pocket like it was 2015 so it was only just when people started having phones that had cameras on them um and and that they could then put it online and other people could share it and then people at least would believe this thing had happened but then as you say um a, a scientist called joe reidenberg she watched the video and she was able to uh, well, uh, uh, like analyze the flight of the whale, and she felt that it, as it turned in the air, it diverted its course and didn't land uh, uh, in the way that it was going to. And then another researcher looked at it, and he said that you could see the whale sticking its eye out and seeing us in midair and turning. So that was fascinating. And I then went and made a, and I found that out while making a documentary about the whales of Monterey Bay uh, for PBS and the BBC. Um, where I was interviewing all the different people who work with the humpbacks there from scientists who tag put like video cameras on them with suction cups to monitor their behavior to people who rescued them from being caught in fishing nets and other gear um, to whale watching boat captains and citizen scientists and underwater filmmakers who've been around them a lot in the water and can speak to what it's like to have that experience and what, how the whales interact with them. Um, and it was and so I placing that experience and people's analysis of it within those other like lenses and those other point viewpoints was fascinating but the the thing uh 
And so I made that film, but then at the end of the film, the craziest thing happened was that they were able to identify from that video and from photographs the whale watchers had taken that day, who the whale was, where it was born, who its mother is, um, how old it is, uh, and where and where and so we've been able to follow its life ever since. So it's about fourteen years old now. Um, it was born uh, probably just off uh, Colombia, and has been seen in Colombia and the waters of Guerrero, which I can't pronounce very well. Guerrero, Guerrero <laughs> off Mexico, and then up into California. It doesn't seem to go further north than California into like as some of the other whales there do. Um, and I was just blown away by this. And the final thing that blew, blew me away was that it wasn't humans who'd done this analysis. It was a combination of people, but the identification was done by an artificial intelligence algorithm that had been developed to uh, do the hard work of whale researchers of identifying whales by their tail flukes. Um, and that fascinated me. And that's what spun me off into what has been four years of researching this book. And I could never have imagined it would bring me to the place that it's now at. Um, but I'm very grateful to it. So all my complaining about being in the news before, <laughs> it was very minor, because like, it's been so fascinating and such a joy. Now that, um, that AI and that um, whale fluke identification, that's through Happy Whale, isn't it? Which, which turns mm -hmm. out to be a, a partner of the WCA. They're one of our partner organizations. And they're, yeah, that's right. Their research is all about citizen science photographs that are in this huge database that can then be searched and analyzed. So you can, as you said, work out who's who in the ocean and which whale is which. And, and I mean, that's amazing to be able to have tracked the whale in that incident. I mean, in the same way that that whale, I guess, could follow you on social media and, and see what you've been up to in the intervening years. Oh. <laughs> Poor whale. <laughs> You've just seen lots of complaints about lockdown, but um, <laughs> uh, and uh, pictures of my daughter. But like, I think um, it's, it is, we're living in such an interesting time uh, for people who are interested in nature, because not only can you, like travel through the internet to all these other places and access all the sum of human knowledge, you can contribute to it too. And Happy Well only started two weeks before the whale breached onto us. So there was another total fluke there, which was that the database existed. Um, and since it started, Ted Cheeseman, the man who, who co-founded Happy Well, he, um, he just wanted to see what they could do. But now they've managed, I think they've got over 500,000 sightings, you know, uh, you know, everywhere, all over the world, Antarctica, like, you know, like the, like the Atlantic, Pacific, South China Sea, everywhere. And they've, I think, identified almost every single North Pacific humpback whale, which is like an astonishing thing and would have been unimaginable. <laughs> and that's all down to this combination of citizen science photographs, mainly from people on whale watching boats and photographs from scientists, professional scientists. And the combination of those two data sets has proven really, really powerful. And now they've been able to figure out that some humpback whales have like sort of friendships or associations and stick with each other year on year. And they've been able to link whales that have one nickname in Vladivostok to whales that have got a different nickname in Japan. Uh, and uh, they've been able to see like where the whales have been going. They've been able to notice in Antarctica where areas where the whales were hunted to, uh, to local extinction, the whales now starting to come back and re-explore those areas uh, after this like end of whaling. Um, and it's such a powerful tool. And, and you know, it, it's not just whales and dolphins. You, this is happening with like with with birds. Like now, there's like apps that can identify birds by their song that you can get on your phone. Or plants. I don't know if you use them, but I identify plants in my garden to figure if, it, if it's a weed or not. You know, if I'm in a park and I want to, I'm quite not quite sure what tree is what. Um, and every time you you take a photograph for those apps to do the uh, identification, or you record the audio, it builds into the, these giant libraries of nature that we're compiling uh, openly together, which is really exciting. It's very cool. I ha I have the 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 plant app on my phone, and any time I'm taking the dog for a walk or going somewhere, and uh, yeah, there's always there's always a pause 
uh, when we're walking and my wife goes, what are you doing? There's always a pause where you're walking the dog. Is that an intentional pun? <laughs> ah, yes, see, actually... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's four pause. Sorry, I'm a, um, I'm a dad, so I'm allowed to do this now. It's, uh, it's true. Sorry. It, it's, well, you know, I'm sure the audience, there's, there's going to be somebody out there that likes it as much as I did. I'm um, fleeing now. So. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i'm always using that app and you know my wife will just kind of go what are you doing it's like oh i'm just taking a picture of this plant so i can find out what it is and it's um but yeah the technology is 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 pretty amazing and mm. you know humpbacks in particular are such a se success story uh for conservation you know it's it, it's very easy to get depressed when you're watching the news and you know again it's something that i know you talk about in your book but is you know talked about very often in, in documentaries as well, uh, you know, the, the, the state of the world and the number of species that are going extinct. And so if you look at humpbacks, they're an incredible success story. You know, at the, at the height of whaling, at the end of, of, of the whaling period in the 70s and 80s, there was less than a thousand humpbacks in the world. The population was decimated. And now they're back to what they reckon is pre-whaling numbers and it's just incredible and that's not to say that there aren't countless threats to them and you know the work's done because it far from is you know there's there's so much that we need to do but it is wonderful to know that there is hope in that way um mm. but um it's, yeah. it's it yeah i mean it's 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 something nice to hang your hat on isn't it Absolutely. It's very, it is encouraging because we came so close and, you know, with, with so many of the cetaceans. Um, and I think one of the things that I've kind of learned in researching the book is I, as a conservation biologist by training, um, I, although I, I loved animals and loved individual animals and thought of them as individuals, as a, on a sort of population level, I didn't really extend that and think of them as individuals, or at least I hadn't made that connection in my mind. But learning about the big differences between individual populations of one species, like how some sperm whales are living in the same seas as others will talk totally differently and hunt totally differently and not really interact with other sperm whales that talk differently and hunt differently. You know, these are cultures and these whale cultures, you know, we know that in human cultures, in oral culture, we can pass information down enormously robustly, for instance, like, uh, there's evidence that from anthropology now that uh, in oral histories in from the people of like Western Australia and from people on the northern uh, European coasts, there are stories about where the water used to be uh, on the coastline in the last ice age. So that's 10,000 years ago. So that's how powerfully you can transmit culture without writing things down. And you think the whales have been in the sea communicating with each other for potentially far longer than humans have been on the land vocally communicating with each other. And we know they're cultured animals that they pass down complex information to each other about the ways they live. So what I really felt really deeply sad about is what damage did we do to these cultures? How many of them must there have been? You know, um, even if the whales came back, we must have lost so many whale cultures in, in, that, in that slaughter without even having the idea that it was there that's sort of and and then you can just extrapolate that to the rest of nature you know we i think for a long time we've thought of other species in terms of their bodies and their numbers and conservation as being how many are there and are they coming back but there are these finer elements to it like what individuals are within those what personalities and what cultures um and that just makes me much more motivated to to preserve them and protect them I mean, or to contribute to that, you know, uh, in the way, any way I can. Absolutely, it's 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 that it, there's um there's a balance there. Uh, working in the nonprofit sector, that that um, often there's a bit of a conflict between conservation and welfare. And as you rightly said, you know, conservation is very much about population and numbers and conserving the environment mm. and the species. But often that's sometimes at the expense of looking at the individual animals and their welfare and and the specificities that are related to that. And so finding a way of balancing that is is so important, I think. Yeah, I think it's it's a bit like being a doctor. The difference between being somebody's GP and being somebody who works at the health service to determining how to split the budget up most effectively across all the patients. I think to be the one person and 
carry both those things in your head, like how to look after the individual and how to look after the population is very, very difficult. I mean, in my film work, that's why producers and directors often are split. So that because they are one person's job is to make sure the film is as dynamic and interesting and beautiful as possible. And the other person's job is to make sure you don't run out of money or nobody gets hurt um, and that you come, come in on, on schedule. And if you're doing those both in your own head, I think it can drive you a bit mad and, and you can always be biased one way or the other. And I think if you're trying to look after a species, you're also trying to be careful and compassionate. Um, it, it does help to have different people like sort of hold each of those roles. Um, Absolutely. Um, we're going to, um, so we're about halfway through this Q and A and um, uh, we're going to, if anybody that's watching now has any questions for Tom, um, we're going to have either time at the end or kind of we can interject the questions, but feel free to ask a question in the chat uh, and we'll, we'll incorporate it into this conversation. Um, but thinking about the book now, Tom, and, you know, if you wouldn't mind just kind of giving those that are uh, uh, watching and who are sure to buy it because, you know, they have to, to be honest. Uh, come <laughs> you have to. I mean, you have to. I mean, you know, that no was pressure, part of guys. Of yeah, it's part of joining the live, right? You actually have to buy the book. It was, uh, there's, there's no yeah. pressure. You don't get to uh, log Otherwise, the whales, you... they'll disapprove. They'll be exactly. Disapprove. Yeah. Yeah. You know, th th that, that humpback that uh, from Happy Whale will be able to track it to your door and it's going to be there knocking on it, say, buy Tom's book and support the WCA as well. Uh, but um, yeah, if there's any questions there, uh, drop them in the chat. But the book, so um don't leave renata that's my wife <laughs> <laughs> you can't leave renata there's a there's a whale outside blocking your exit yeah um but no the um so the book uh, tell us a little bit about um about the concept you know how to speak whale and so what's the what's the specifics of that obviously you know we we know that this event happened with the humpback and you know kind of <laughs> talked about AI a little bit and, and this identification, but then what what got you to that question of, of you know, how to speak whale and, and, and where does that lead us in regards to, you know, what that means and the technology involved? Because this isn't just a book about, you know, abstracts. This, this actually leads to something that could have a profound impact on our understanding of the world, of whales, of conservation, of ourselves. So, how, how did that all come about and uh, lead you into the book? Well, I, I was I think it was the use of the pattern recognition software to match the tail fluke of, uh, of my whale or the whale that, that breached onto us uh, with the database. And I just wanted to see as a biologist what this meant more widely in biology as we start to turn use these machines, most of which we've developed for finding patterns in human behavior and facial features. Um, and apply them to the natural world and specifically cetaceans. Um, so I met people who, I went to Hawaii and met people designing uh, self-propelled vehicles that uh, travel across whole oceans, listening for whales, recording all the time, people putting arrays of hydrophones on the seabed, people, uh, as I said, like flying drones over whales or putting recording devices on them. And all of all of this adds up to are a, a massively increased ability to record information from the lives of whales and dolphins in the wild. Um, and so much of uh, our work in, or our understanding of the behavior of whales and dolphins and until relatively recently has come uh, from captive experiments on dolphins, uh, which obviously aren't wild. So you're not seeing like an animal in its society in its culture behaving in a wild way. Um, and we've also never really been able to see like whales like living and seeing how they interact with each other um, and and record those behaviors because we, we might have been able to observe them from boats like whalers did and naturalists did and sailors did but we we couldn't capture and record that behavior and compare it but then the next thing that I did is I went to all these conferences where people were comparing all of these recordings they'd made, primarily bioacoustic recordings, sound recordings, 
and they were just swamped by them. There's like so many hours, more hours than any of them in their lifetimes could listen through, let alone listen through and compare to each other, trying to perceive patterns within them. Um, and then what was happening at these conferences was people were starting to use artificial intelligence tools to do that pattern finding work for the biologists. And the absolute game changing thing is the arrival of uh, language processing tools, uh, the kinds of tools that translate in Google Translate. So Google Translate uh, works very well, but it doesn't know w uh, what uh, a language is. It's, it doesn't have bi uh, bilingual dictionaries, so it can translate between English and French and Urdu and Spanish without ever being given a bilingual dictionary. And it does that by taking huge corpuses, huge data sets of written or spoken language and analyzing the relationships between all the words and all the like structures in those languages and kind of making a huge interrelationship cloud uh, in hundreds of dimensions of how those words relate to each other. And it can take this geometrical uh, like sort of arrangement of a language and shape like a galaxy. And if it does that for multiple languages, they actually map onto each other the AIs find hidden linguistic patterns within languages that humans aren't able to perceive. And it uses them to translate between human languages without ever being told like, like what one word is in a different language. And obviously that is extremely exciting uh, for um, people who want to study animal communication systems because we don't have dictionaries of dolphin communication systems. We don't have dictionaries for prairie dogs. So we're always having to try and find our way into their communication systems from the other end from the simplest units like signature whistles and dolphins or uh, alarm calls in prairie dogs whereas now we can map um languages well sorry potential languages because the like the status quo is that we don't believe that other species have languages but i would argue that we've never given ourselves the chance to discover that um and uh so right now uh, there are a number of projects underway specifically designed to get data sets perfect for these AI tools um, to try and see if other species have languages. And one of them is with sperm whales of Dominica, where Project SETI is currently trying to get the biggest animal behavior data set of all times. And with soft robotic fish swimming among the whales, huge hydrophone arrays, drones flying above them, dropping new hydrophones among them. Um, and they're going to get this big, well, big animal data, they're calling it pipeline. And once they've got that data, they're going to start applying loads and loads of different kinds of algorithms to find different kinds of patterns within them. And then teaming up with linguists, they're going to start like then sort of figuring out whether these, what, how, like how sperm whale communication systems work. And their game plan is to attempt to speak to the sperm whales by 2026, which is pretty far out. Yeah. Um, Amazing. That's just, and, and what's incredible about this, and I remember when you first told me about this, and it just blew my mind, because we're talking about, and we can only do this, right, because we're at the point in technology where we have this, um, with this deep learning, these deep learning AI tools that can analyze so much data at, at once, and, and find these hidden patterns that we would just never be able to see or be aware of, and just... Um, now being able to use that in such a way is 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 game changing right hmm. it it i don't think we've really understood at least the general public hasn't understood how transformative these tools are going to be for biology um i think uh one recent uh, amazing development that you could try and transpose onto animal behavior was um there's a program uh, called Alpha Fold made by an a company called DeepMind, which is one of the best AI companies in the world. And Alpha Fold thinks about how proteins might fold. So it thinks about the, the, the structure, the particle structure of the molecular structure rather of proteins. And so in biochemistry, figuring out if you've got like the chemical formula of a protein, figuring out what shape it's gonna be, it's really hard and complicated and takes a long time. And AlphaFold has now mapped and predicted the uh, shapes uh, of every single known protein. It's basically solved that whole realm of biochemistry at a stroke. And 
I think that's the way that we're going to start seeing things happening with AI being brought into finding patterns in nature. Like the simple way of putting it is that these analytical tools help us see patterns our brains aren't capable of seeing. And biology is the study of finding patterns in nature, interactions, communications, uh, where things grow, how animals communicate with each other, uh, like what happens when temperatures and the sea change. Uh, all of these things are patterns. And now we have superhuman help in analyzing and discovering patterns. Uh, so it's, I think, in, in a way, I wish I was, you know, I'm 39. I wish I was at going, I was 19 and just entering university because I would totally become uh, an AI biologist. Um, the amount, because uh, I, I just, uh, it, it, and it, it's very conflicting because to be, to have these tools to discover things in nature at the same time as we're trashing it so comprehensively is really conflicting. And it feels like a race to find out things so that we can protect them and that, that these discoveries can help us preserve and help nature to flourish and recover. Um, but it, it, it's, yeah, it's pretty full on. Uh, it, it, it is. And it's it, it, interesting what you said there about, you know, use of language and, um, you know, that there's conjecture over, you know, we, we, we're saying, you know, to be able to hear whales and understand them and, and use this to uh, to be able to speak to them by 2026. And as you said, there's the uh, the, the assumption uh, that there's a language that we can use to actually speak, which is um there's a certain degree of, of, of kind of, would it be arrogance or something that, because the way that, mm -hmm. that, that science tends to work in research is particularly with animals, let's assume that they don't suffer or that they mm -hmm. aren't as smart as us until we can prove otherwise. And I wonder if that from a welfare perspective sometimes is linked to our use of them. You know, it would be awfully yes. inconvenient uh, if we if we knew that, that pigs and sheep and, and cows and chickens uh, absolutely, I mean, we, we know that they share almost all the same feelings and emotions that we do but if you could prove it and have a conversation with them that would make the farming industry a pretty complicated thing to justify so i, I kind of feel like yes. there's this this change and this shift in perspective that when we get to this point with whales could be a pretty defining moment in in how we look and treat nature yeah the franz de Waal, who's a primatologist he, he has a term for this which is anthropo denial which is our tendency to deny um, that other species might have traits that we have. Um, and I, I think, as you correctly identify it, convenience is one of the reasons we find it hard to um, allow ourselves to admit that animals might think and feel in similar ways or in realms like the ways that we do. I think there's other, other elements to it too. I think one is our culture and it's hard to change what you've been taught um growing up you know so i find it hard like i try really hard to be a vegetarian for instance sometimes i fail even though i'm a conservation biologist and, and a zoologist and i'm aware of um the consciousness of other beings and the suffering in the food industry but somehow when I'm in Yorkshire, in the Yorkshire Dales, where my father was from, and the local butcher is there, and that's my link to my, he, my, he died seven, so seven years ago, my dad. And that's my link into that community and to him. The butchers still talk about him more than anybody else in the village. So I find it hard. I feel there's the, the, the culture we inherit, the food culture, the way we, the culture we have of interacting with other species, I think can override our logical understanding of what they're like. And I think that, and I think we're seeing that culture change as 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 we go through through younger and younger generations. You see shifts in their preferences and the, the, how they feel towards other species. Um, you see, since the 1950s, a huge boom in pets or companion animals, and how much money people are willing to spend on their companion animals, and how they see them as extended members of their family. Whereas previously, in surveys, people would often see them more as um, tools they would be like useful and it was also nice to be around them and i think the final 
reason we find it very hard to imagine that other species might talk or uh, is that it challenges our identity, our self uh, idea of what, what we are. Because if, if the earth isn't the center of the universe, if there isn't, if you don't happen to believe that God created us, us in his image, if you don't have a way of thinking that you're like who you are and what sets you apart from the rest of nature and you, it, it can be unnerving to think that we are just one species among many rather than the uh, you know the, the this identity that we have crafted for ourselves of being very special and I, I think one facet of um this work in because the machines see things that we can't for two reasons one because their processing power is so powerful but two because they don't mind what they find whereas i think we often hold back from quite fully embracing the knowledge of the, the the feelings and the inner worlds of other species um and i think it could be very culturally challenging for humans to be aware that we are not the only talkers that we live in a world of many conversations going on and many minds and many senses um and many of us would really love that but i think a lot of us would find it very challenging very much so and you know you kind of you know we we got out of the realm of cetaceans there but obviously what we're talking about here has such wider connotations to to just our our place in the world and the way we treat nature and the way we treat animals and i i found it interesting one of the points that you made in the book uh towards the end where where you know when we're always looking for these ways to separate why we are separate from the animal kingdom you know it's kind of like they'll they'll find a you know a a part of the brain that doesn't seem to exist in in some other animal or or the way the neural network connects and we'll go oh well this is what makes us different and then they'll find it another animal and go oh okay well i guess we're not that special then um mm. and there seems to be this repeated pattern of, of of almost trying to prove that we are different even though all the evidence suggests that we're not um and there's that constant battle between those two things in research yeah, I think that comes from an idea that, that, that there's a hierarchy uh, rather than there's a diversity. And I think within our, and it's hard to escape that because our culture is still very hierarchical. We have bosses, we have pay scales, and we have like power, like dynamics. And so it's hard for us not to transpose that onto that very human way of organizing our own society right now onto all of nature, which actually is really silly. Um, but you can see why why we do it. Um, I, a really interesting thing, as I, I didn't it didn't make the book, it was a conversation I had afterwards. But there's a woman called Sue Savage Rumba, and she did some experiments with bonobos about 30 years ago, or well, until re a bit more recently, try, uh, with the bonobo Kokanzi, who learned how to use lexigrams, like sort of symbol representations of human of like some human language features to communicate. And she said that she thought the reason that people don't are really into understanding what whales and dolphins are saying but kind of shudder a bit and held back with chimps and bonobos is that whales and dolphins are like aliens they're like for some people they're far away they live in the sea so we can kind of deal with it a bit more mm. that they're that they might speak to because they're so different whereas it's more threatening for us to imagine that more similar animals like chimpanzees and bonobos uh could have these uh linguistic features uh, because then it blurs the boundaries of where they end and we begin. Yeah, it's really interesting and a really, really good point. We've had a um, we've had a couple of questions and a couple of points come in. Um, an interesting observation from uh, from from Catherine um talking about this uh, intuitiveness that we have with animals again you know when you're around a dog or a horse or an animal but we know that they're communicating you, you you can pick up on the language of these animals um in a way that um is 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 quite obvious this clearly communicate any any dog owner can read their dog and and, and understand mm. what that dog is telling you in in some incredibly subtle ways um and and, totally. and, it's, and and it's very very true you don't need scientific uh research to, to to do this but again it goes back to you know what's convenient and what isn't convenient to, to, to people's everyday lives 
but uh, um, and it can be overwhelming it can be overwhelming you know like yeah. it's sort of kept being worried about everybody all the humans is an overwhelming feeling so being worried about all the humans and all the animals how, where do you begin like i think <laughs> you know it's it's so perhaps there's a self-defense mechanism there somewhere for, for people to just like just focus on what's around them and um i think the thing that's really that really made me really deeply understand that i'm an animal was the birth of of stella my daughter because watching a child come out of a person watching a baby being born is so animal it is so it's uh, you just think this you know and in my filming career i've had the luck to film lots of animals being born bats kangaroos like giraffes and i hope my wife doesn't mind me saying this but it it wasn't that different you know the, the um and your wife I mean, they were all man with a long neck right yes it was a long drop it was an unconventional <laughs> birth and stella's horns her also combs were still flat back no uh but and then you know when she was before she, she's only her words are just coming now she's almost two um but she was clearly communicating with us from a lot a long time before she had the capacity to to vocalize and form words um and yes as as we intuitively can feel in interactions with other species that, that don't require words to nonetheless communicate i mean in the book i go into this quite a lot in in looking at interspecific associations like both historical ones between humans and other animals but also how many different uh in the natural world uh, interspecies teamwork associations there are between shrimps and fish that like share their burrows and uh, coyotes and badgers that go hunting together and they don't have a language but they still find a very good way to communicate with each other and without communication they wouldn't be able to team up and help each other hmm, absolutely this um i mean the, the the how old is your daughter tom how old is she almost two almost two i mean it's it's the the world that she's inheriting is going to be something pretty like i i i imagine as a as a parent you must be kind of like there's this fear of of all the horrible things that we know but equally there's the other side to it when we you know what we're talking about in the book and the technology and the and the world that she's going to inherit with our greater understanding there's there's also cause for hope there i suppose and it's going to be an, a pretty incredible time uh for her and for you to be able to see the world through her eyes as she grows up absolutely and i think i can totally sympathize with people who choose not to reproduce because they feel the world is in such a terrifying state but i was born when the chernobyl explosion happened and you know my older sister went did like nuclear exercises at school mm. and there were people who made the same decision back then because they thought mutually assured destruction was just about to happen i feel that i feel the more i spend time with researchers in all their different fields i just know how little we know so it's impossible to have a good enough overview to really know how messed up things are or not and whether we do have a chance of changing things or how much we could contribute but i do know that in her short life already she's lived such a full life mm -hmm. and so i feel very happy for that uh by will battle against anything to make sure it's in a beautiful living world with her happy in it no, she's lucky to have you as a dad, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> Apart from the jokes. <laughs> well, yeah, I think, I, I think that just comes with the territory, right? I mean, you know, she's going to have yeah. to put up with that. It can't all be roses and uh, and sunshine, no, can it? She's yeah. doomed joke-wise. <laughs> so we've got a couple of questions. Amanda, uh, who is actually working behind the scenes and is the reason why this live stream has been so uh, smooth and successful, um, she is one of the WCA partners. So thank you for working and, and helping us out with this, Amanda. But she posed a question. Uh, which really gets to the, you know, the, the, what we're talking about here ultimately, which is, you know, she asked, what do you think humpback songs are saying with their reputation for moving between Wales? Could it be like, is it a map, a history, a song that just sounds nice? I mean, what we're talking about here, and obviously it's all speculation, but obviously <laughs> we're, we're going to know in, in 2026, absolutely, uh, without a doubt um well that exactly. sperm whales they're working with i'll give them a caveat oh uh, yeah you know, yeah but again yeah, they're, they're probably all saying the same thing right um <laughs> Harry. i, I know, think i know, I know they, i'm joking too um i think it's very unclear i think I, I i mean personally i find it amazing that we don't know why humpback whales breach and we don't know why they sing um and we have theories about it but those theories 
don't have much support and a lot of them rely on saying well it could be this as well as this as well as this and um it, the songs could have many fun i mean they, clearly they have some sort of important function because they require so much energy like i i, I filmed a whale singing and i hung above it and watched it for like hours and you know the whole sea rang and it must be using so much of its energy hard won like uh, blubber that it's stored up in those winter feeding sessions um sorry summer feeding sessions in the in the colder waters um so but i i have you know what the more i've looked into it the less i think i we have any idea why, why they sing and i think that applies to singing in other species too i think we've had a very shallow understanding of singing mainly based on our misunderstanding that in songbirds is just what males do whereas actually in birds males and females in every branch of the bird family tree sing so if singing is something that males do to impress females that doesn't stand up as a theory everywhere so i think probably it means different things in different places um and it could well just be because it feels really nice like like but it feels like then why would it change all the time why would it need to change all the time um but then there's an interesting facet to this with humpbacks which is i do think we should be very careful before we start trying to speak to whales um and start, before we start pumping sounds that sound like their sounds into the seas towards them because we don't want to mess with them and disrupt these social uh, and these cultures uh, that they have because we don't have a very good track record when it comes to making contact with other populations of our own species so i think we should that partly why i've written the book is to make people take this seriously um this possibility that we could be able to speak uh to whales or speak like whales to whales um that we how do we want to do that what boundaries do we want to draw who's going to make sure that it's done ethically who's going to own the information um who's going to make sure we don't misuse that and exploit it um, that's a, a, lot, a sort of a, a, a bit of a sort of side sidetrack from uh, Amanda's question. Sorry, but but it's really true. I mean, it's that, that line from Jurassic Park, isn't it? You know, you're so busy working <laughs> if you can, what, you have to decide whether or not you should. And I think with any technology, mm -hmm. with any advance, this you know that's really really present there. I mean, I guess this is another speculative question that that is linked to to, to Amanda's. But you know, if we <sighs> we can't presume to know what they're going to be talking about and using ai that you know there are certain commonalities that we can imagine the under you know we could maybe take a leap of faith and think that they you know they have an understanding of family and connection and culture in some context in the physical world that they're in uh, and maybe there'll be an understanding of you know food and temperature and and and, and proximity and, and and things that are probably common but we're looking through the lens of a creature that is so dissimilar to us in in the way that it exists in the world from your from your perspective and your understanding of where we are and i know we've only got a couple of minutes left uh but what do you think um like how close are we going to be able to get to really understanding them is it is it going to be enough for it to have that profound effect on our place in the world and our relationship with with other animals i think it's an unanswerable question now it's a bit like i, th I think that a parallel is you know we're, we're living in an age where we discovered a sort of new looking machine like a new telescope and now we can turn it towards things that we couldn't see with our own senses we can't know what we're going to find because we couldn't see things there before we just had ideas about what might have been there what we'll find and how that will affect us that's going to play out but it would be very peculiar if we didn't find complex surprising things that we didn't expect because our expectations are based on what we know and what that's limited and it's about to change spectacularly um they've got enormous brains they've got long lives they've got complex lives knitted together uh, socially with sound we know those sounds are enormously diverse they're very sophisticated in how they make them hear them and process them um and they've been making them for a very very long time very successfully if we didn't find 
it may be that we can't understand understand them our brains might be too different our lives might be too different but it also might be that you know they have similar you know problems to us they give birth to babies that they care about and look after and protect from the dangers of the world they teach each other how to feed and move around they look after each other when they're sick they seem to mourn some of them they uh, some species te- like uh, have menopause uh, which indicates that it's more that there is wisdom in the older females that is more valuable in leadership than in risking further like uh, birth the, these are things that we share um so i i don't know honestly i feel like there's a lot in common there's a lot difference there's a, a joke that somebody made which is like what would be the whale speak for wet you know how would how would we even help conceptualize that in a conversation <laughs> Um, what kind of whale speaks are there that we would never be able to get our head around because there are, our elements are so different. But I, I feel like the, op- I, th- I feel very optimistic about whether we might get each other because they're really inquisitive. They cut, or at least, sorry, this is a huge generalization because there's so many species, but some species are very inquisitive and come over and check us out and look at us and bring their young over to us and uh, playful. And they form into specific associations. Like some cetacean species are really different from each other, different anatomy, different natural histories, different lifestyles. And yet they seem to make friends across those species boundaries. So maybe we've got a chance to. Fascinating stuff. It really is. I mean, it's such, and, and what's really exciting about this, Tom, is that we don't have long to wait. We're talking 2026. We may have some concept of what communication in this uh, this other species and the impact that that could have on the work that we both do through conservation filmmaking and and welfare and conservation, uh, but also just kind of the way people see the world. It, It can't be understated. It's just, it could be incredibly profound. You know, we could be having a conversation in a, in a few years time when your daughter's a little bit older and be able to actually understand. And it, it could change the way we view the world. And uh, it, it, it's pretty inc- incredible to think that we could be there soon. I think, I think the thing that excites me is just that we might learn to listen better. It's not necessarily to speak to a whale, it's learn to be able to listen to a whale and appreciate the world through a different perspective. I think that could be, you know, the famous uh, pale blue dot photograph. Mm -hmm. Uh, Was it the Voyager space probe took as it left the solar system looking back? And you just saw this tiny little dot of the Earth in space. I think that was a very big moment for the environmental movement. And I think having a perspective on us from another consciousness and trying to get that and look back and see ourselves as we actually are, rather than as we project ourselves as being, I think will be humbling and beautiful um, and helpful uh, for, I mean, like we live in such hubristic times. Look at the present owner of Twitter and just the esteem that we have for ourselves. And um, uh, uh, so are anything that can serve as some sort of antidote to that. And I hope this is it or part of it. I cannot think of a better way much as I would love to carry on talking to you, Tom, uh, we we are out of time, but I can't think of a better way to, to summarize everything that we've talked about. Um, thank you so much for your, it's been a joy talking to you, Tom. I, I, I hope we will be able to do this again, whether there's people listening or not. It's fascinating. Um, and um, for people that want to buy Tom's book, and I would encourage you to do so, uh, Tom recommended that I buy the audio book because you actually get to listen to whale song and and, uh, and whale sound. Uh, it was it was brilliant. It brought it to live uh, to, to life in an extraordinary way. Please go. You've got the link there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, buy Tom's book. Give it as a gift for Christmas. Give it to anybody that you like. People you don't like. Just give it to anyone, buy the book, it's fantastic. Yeah, especially people you don't like, just pile it on them. Yeah, just anyone, just buy the book and give it to everyone. Um, (laughs) It it really is genuinely a fantastic book. It's a wonderful read. Um, uh, Go on to the World Cetacean Alliance website. Please visit our website as well, support our work. 
uh, help us protect whales and dolphins and porpoises around the world, uh, become a WCA ally, go to our WCA shop, follow our campaigns, sign our uh, sign up to our newsletter, sign our petitions to to to, to help protect dolphins, um, all of that good stuff. And yeah, thank you again, this- Tom. Is this recorded? Is it possible to it share is, this? It is recorded, yeah. We're going to be Great. able to download this, so we'll make this available. Uh, so anybody that wasn't able to catch this live, we will post this up on our social media, and I guess you as well, Tom, and make this available. Yeah, it was a really nice chat. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'd love to share it. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, everybody, for your comments, uh, for your questions. Um, and thank you, Amanda, for behind the scenes. Uh, for helping out and uh, yeah uh, wish you all a Merry Christmas everybody that's listening and um, see you all again and thanks again Tom thank you thanks Harry happy Christmas everyone